Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Uh, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right, so I'm sitting here and I'm talking to Austin Lester. And Austin, I'm going to go ahead and just ask you to introduce yourself, man. Uh, what's up, guys? Austin Lester, like you said. Um, so, yeah, man, I, uh, I'm a full-time videographer, photographer, media guy, and survival instructor for Fieldcraft Survival. Uh, I've been working for these guys a little over a year now. Started October of last year. Uh, and so I actually transitioned right out of the military into working with them. Um, and I, it, it's actually just probably the coolest company on the planet to work for, man. <laughs> I don't work for them, but I'll definitely second that. So let's start out like, cause if people look you up on social media, they're going to see a name and it's not Austin Lester media or anything like that. It's, it's kind of yeah. cool. Cause I mean, it sounds badass, right? But so <laughs> tell everybody what that is and how you actually came about to get that. <laughs> yeah. So my, uh, my Instagram handle is savage luster. So, um, I get, I get screwed with about it all the time just because the guys, you know, they're always like, Oh, you're not a savage. Cause I'm way too nice. But, um, <laughs> it actually, <laughs> it started way before savage, uh, was really a thing. Like Savage today was savage for me in high school, which is where I got the nickname. So um, I grew up in a really rural part of North Carolina and uh, a bunch of rednecks and hillbillies. And I love them all dearly. But uh, I grew up at we um, I graduated with like 56 other people. Right. So super small high school. But I was the only Native American kid that went to the school. <laughs> and so <laughs> everybody called me savage. And I was I just rolled with it. Right. Like I didn't care. It just. I grew up with it and, and like I went to class with the same kids I went to class with from like freaking kindergarten, like all the way up and through. So that was uh, we me knew too. Each other really well, but, yeah, <laughs> I actually, so. I actually, I think my graduating class was one of the largest classes. I mean, now I'm sure that's changed quite a bit because uh, the town's grown exponentially. But at the time, my class, graduating class was a hundred kids. And wow. most yeah. of those kids I knew all the way through grade school, all the way up. And now it's, yeah. it's kind of weird. Cause I don't know anybody when I go into that town, but, but I know, uh, <laughs> man, I, same way for me, man. It's so weird. Yeah. But so let's kind of talk about, I mean, did you do much hunting or anything like that in your youth or was it, was it like every once in a while, what, what was your, your style of hunting and stuff? Yeah. So growing up in a really rural part of North Carolina and I, and I'm actually from like, if you ever have ever seen the Andy Griffith show, um, the old black and white about the sheriff, black and white show about the sheriff. Um, I'm from Mayberry, like literally Mayberry. Um, they call it, <laughs> yeah, they call it Mount Pilot in the, in the show, but it's, it's from Pilot Mountain. So I'm from about 40 minutes outside of town of Mount Airy, <laughs> North Carolina. So, I mean, way out in the boonies. And, um, but yeah, it, the culture there is just, I mean, I mean, that's it. There's, there's, there's farmers, you know, you can either go grow your corn or your tobacco and, uh, factory workers, a lot of blue collar people. And a lot of people relied on hunting, fishing, uh, and foraging is literally just, I mean, it was the lifestyle, you know? And so, uh, my dad, my, my family wasn't super into it. I had a few friends, uh, that were really into it. And actually the first week of hunting season, of deer season every year, whether it was rifle or archery, they actually just shut down school for the, <laughs> of high school for the first week because nobody showed up anyway. Everybody was out hunting. So I would go with, <laughs> I would go with my buddies and I was never really like very in tune with what was going on. I just wanted to go because it was the thing to do. But, um, I'll never forget like watching one of my buddies drop a, a white tail with an, with a bow and arrow. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. Like, <laughs> how do you do that, man? You know? And, and I watched him gut it and clean it. And, uh, I, I was just super intrigued. And I, even younger, you know, I was, I was in boy scouts and, uh, I learned like the motto was be prepared. Right. So you just, 
you get it, super involved in a lifestyle of being outdoors and preparedness and that's just a way of life out there and sustaining yourself so definitely being surrounded by it made a huge impact on my life so let's talk about foraging a little bit then i mean are you into it now or was it something that you were into as a kid somewhat to maybe harvesting ginseng or i mean there because, I mean, you probably grew up in a super, super diverse ecosystem to be able to, to fauna, fauna on flora. I mean, if you think about it, like, there's a lot going on there in North Carolina. There is, man. And it's I, so foraging. I I never really understood the benefit to it. I didn't do a whole ton of it. But um, I had a lot of friends that were really, really into that. Right. And, I, and that's where I picked up most of the things that I'm into is just. Uh, guys I got along with in school, I noticed what they were into and I was like, cool, yeah, I'll go do that. And uh, I had one buddy of mine, Colin, growing up and super knowledgeable kid, man. And I mean, I remember 15, 16 years old, he would take me out and teach me about different mushrooms and um, all kinds of stuff. He would take me out and we'd uh, forage a whole bunch. We'd take them back and knowing what I know about mushrooms now, which isn't a whole lot, but a lot more than I did then. I mean, that's super dangerous, right? Like, you don't know what you're grabbing and eating. Well, so if you don't uh, know what you're eating, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, luckily I never got jacked up, but, um, uh, but yeah, there's a huge ecosystem there with a ton of different, different stuff. So do you do any, uh, like foraging now then for like the whole survival so aspect or, you know, it's not really been my forte. Um, I've done some of it, especially when I was in Washington State, uh, where I lived there for a few years. There's a ton of foraging to do there. Huckleberries, um, I mean, wild strawberries, rose hips, stuff like that. And um, it's a lot more prominent there. Here in Utah, there's a ton to forage as well, but I just haven't. I've only been here for a few months, and it's been cold ever since yeah. then. So there hasn't been much for me to kind of get my wheels turning with it. But I definitely intend to uh, hit that hard when spring, summer comes around. Yeah, I think that's definitely my next step is learning more like green plants. I, uh, I've, I've kind of done it to where I found enough mushrooms in my area to where I'm comfortable with quite a few of them, but I'm still kind of at the point where it's like I, I can identify plants now and I need to start learning to identify more of them and then identify these other plants throughout the various growing stages, I think is, is like super important. Yeah. And, uh, so I plan yeah. on trying to do that for sure that this coming year. So, yeah, that's one of the, I was just going to say, that's one of the, one of the tough things about foraging as a whole is, um, a lot of people don't understand or even in a book, right? Like if you take a book out to the woods and you're like, uh, I think this is it, but I don't know. It depends on, like you said, what stage that plant is in, um, and being able to identify it early and then late in the season, uh, versus just right whenever it's you know, best to be harvested is, can be a little bit challenging, but I, I bought, I have multiple books where I would go out in the woods different times of the year. And, uh, actually it's weird that you bring that up because I have the book and I would go out and rose hips is a really good example. Like I'd find it early in the season and I'd break off a couple of the leaves, a couple of the, you know, uh, the stem and put it in the book and I'd go back like a month later and do it again and then do it again another month or two later, just so I could see and kind of learn how it looked uh, throughout the stage and throughout the process of it kind of growing and then dying off for the winter. So that helped me. It's just something that maybe you or anybody else could really do to, to yeah, help. That's actually a pretty good idea. So, um, with your photography, let's kind of, I want to get into that a little bit because you, I mean, I saw you got a bunch of cool pictures on social media and stuff like that. And, um, a lot of it is the field craft side and the training and stuff, but you recently went on an elk hunt along with the Eastman boys, which yeah, probably pretty cool and definitely a learning experience. Yeah. So can you kind of like lead into that and talk about um, the, the experience that you had and kind of how it started out and everything went from there? Or? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So uh, first off, thanks for the compliment, man. I appreciate that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've only been doing photography, videography for um, – little over a year now I, I mean I started like a month or two before I actually uh, started working for Fieldcraft doing it full-time which is crazy um, super I was always artistic growing up and paint and draw and do all that artistic stuff but um, I picked up a camera when I got home from a deployment and uh, was just interested in learning and went to YouTube University and just figured it out and <laughs> got hired a, a couple months later to do it full-time so I just I think I got super lucky and um, but yeah, so I, 
I just, it, I'm really passionate about it. And I think that it's really a cool way to, to share knowledge through, um, a, a cool picture or a cool video. So, um, but yeah, I going out with the Eastman's man, it was awesome. So Mike has been, um, uh, Mike Glover has been, you know, working with Fieldcraft survival, working with the Eastman's doing articles for their journal. And he's been doing that for like a year. Um, mainly just kind of himself through his own, you know, as Mike. And so the guys up there, um, Ike Eastman, um, Guy Eastman, and then Scott Reekers, who's their digital media um, kind of manager, have known Mike for a while, known about the company. And we've been trying to plan something. And then obviously COVID hit and it was this whole fiasco. But um, we had something scheduled, you know, and he's like, well, Mike, Kevin, you guys come out and go on a hunt. And then Mike's like, well, Hey, you're going to come film the whole thing. And I was like, all right, well, a bunch of stuff came up with the company and it's just been growing like crazy. So Mike really couldn't step away from his CEO duties at the time. So, um, I kind of got the the opportunity to just kind of roll out there and, and link up with the guys. And, um, we were supposed to go in on horseback and go up in this huge mountain and, um, and hunt up there for a tag that they had, um, uh, that Scott Reekers had and some weather rolled in the day that, you know, we pulled in there and the entire mountain got hit with damn near a blizzard. And he's like, <laughs> so, uh, we can still go up there if you really want, <laughs> or, um, we can throw an audible kind of link up with, uh, they had a really good friend, family friend of theirs, uh, named Johnny, John Stovall. And he, uh, he used to print their magazine for them kind of early on in the company, printed it for them for like 12 years. And then due to some corporate things with the printing company and them transitioning in their company, they had to switch to a different printer, but obviously remained friends with him for a long time. And, um, so Johnny had been putting in for a tag, uh, a bull tag in this one specific area um, near Cody, Wyoming for 12 years. And he finally drew the tag. And he's like, so let's go link up with him and we'll kind of document his experience. He's been out there for, excuse me, he's been out there for a couple of days now, but I think we can link up with him, film and document the process and, and kind of teach some lessons along the way. And um, so I got to talk to them about preparedness, survival aspect, and um, I got to learn a lot about the, the hunting big game process for them. So insane experience. So I know you kind of, I've heard you talk about it, but as far as like the gear and the difference um, between like a, the military gear that you were issued for cold mm-hmm. weather survival versus <laughs> like hunting gear. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> leaps and bounds almost, isn't it? The yeah. Difference. yeah. Yeah. And you know, and that's something that, that I was really surprised by is like, so the gear that you can get as a civilian is, I mean, it's whatever you can afford really. Like you can have, I mean, you can go <laughs> buy the suit that guys, you know, summit Everest in if you want it. Um, in the military, what was, what was different is that it's kind of like a, what's the verbiage I want to use? Like, uh, whatever's best for the most amount of people at an affordable rate. So, <laughs> um, here's a jacket and pants and boots that have been worn by 10 guys before you. And yeah, there's a few holes. Yeah. You can just patch them up and you kind of just figure it out. But at the end of the day, it was like good gear that you learned to rely on, that you learned how to use. And um, what kind of caught me by surprise is that as I've been diving more and more into the hunting community, like a lot of hunters, um, and people that spend any time in the backcountry, um, they aren't as prepared as I kind of thought that people would be. And I, I think that, um, a lot of guys just kind of rely on their knowledge of, of doing it for years and years and years, or they're so used to the routine of how things work. And, um, so they just kind of roll with it, which is, I, I think what, a majority of people do, but even being out there, you know, they issued our Eastman's guys gave me a bunch of really nice Sitka gear. And <laughs> so I got to like, I got to wear like that Gucci gear out in the field and it made all the freaking difference, man, because it was cold. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you noticed that like aren't really bridging the gap for your traditional hunter that maybe they should look into as far as, um, survival aspect or something like that, or, or knowledge? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say probably the number one priority is is med. A lot, I, I've never seen or haven't met many people uh, that carry any med supplies when they go out into the woods. And um, maybe a guy will be you know a little ahead of the curve and carry a tourniquet, or he's got like a little boo boo kit with some band aids and stuff. But um, 
really if educating yourself on what are common injuries for outdoorsmen and you know you're you're like if you just look at the nature of what you're doing, you know, you're carrying a gun or a, or an arrow, a bow with an arrow that <laughs> sharp edge or a, a really fast moving projectile that could hurt you. And uh, statistically, you know, um, you got to look at the things that can hurt you and that are the, the biggest, most likely things to hurt you and prepare for those. So, you know, carrying a tourniquet, carrying um, some hemostatic gauze and hemostatic gauze is just a gauze that is. Uh, kind of laced with a hemostatic agent, which is just a fancy word for a, a chemical that promotes the coagulation process of stopping um, the bleed. So um, carrying stuff like that, carrying a, like a SAM splint, so that way you can splint uh, twisted ankles uh, and long bone fractures, stuff like that, because um, that's where a lot of people get out there and get messed up. You know, um, they have a, an AD, an accidental discharge, and, you know, shoot themselves, shoot a buddy or you know, stab an arrow in their leg or, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that can happen. And you got to think about that time in which an event happens and how far you are in there, how long it's going to take help to get into you, how long it may take you to get out and being prepared, for, especially uh, medically is a, is a huge consideration for, for a hunter. Well, I think you'll be proud of me because this, this year, I, or well, I guess it would be this past hunting season. I started carrying a yeah. TQ, a, a tourniquet in, my pack so <laughs> yeah that's being prepared awesome, man. For that's that, a step. Yeah. i mean like when i go like out west or something like that i've got a more extensive med kit than like what my whitetail hunting kit is because obviously i'm not as deep i'm not as far but i definitely right. started carrying a tourniquet now and a few other little things so I, i'm definitely yeah. going in the more of that direction because i started thinking about it and it's true man i mean i think it was glover that actually kind of made that like light bulb go off in my head and i'm like oh man you know it's got a valid point. And, and then to even reinforce that, I was uh, watching some footage of a guy named Corey Jacobson, and I believe it was uh, uh, Dave Brinker, and he was hunting with him. Oh, yeah. And uh, he he tripped and fell, and the arrow fell out of his quiver and, yep. and, and went right through his, right through his, his calf. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it happens, and that's a prime example. And they, they didn't have probably what they needed but they had enough between no. the three of them to improvise so i mean yeah. they, they definitely made it happen but uh it could it could have been definitely a lot worse if it would have hit you know something a different artery or something like that so absolutely man yeah. and i and i i, I kind of feel like i just got uh i don't want to say lucky i mean i i went to school and went and be, worked for ems and became a medic and did that for a little while but um, before even joining the military. So just having that background of knowledge for me has been super beneficial, um, obviously for all the hobbies and things that I enjoy doing. But um, it, and I think that the lay person, you know, the average everyday Joe, you know, they don't necessarily have that knowledge. So it's important to really like not only have the equipment, but to seek out the training and learn that stuff and, and, and find it out there. Um, and not necessarily just relying on YouTube, you know, or something like that to figure out what medical things you're going to do to yourself or someone else that could potentially save your life. No, I, I think, uh, advanced like casualty care type class or something like that would super beneficial to anybody that's going to spend any extended period of time out there in the outdoors for sure. Um, so did you end up giving all the guys at Eastman a tourniquet or what? We did. Yeah. So I, I, uh. <laughs> I went up there anticipating like bearing gifts of just friendship and like, Hey, you know, our company has all this stuff. So here we wanted to share it with you, but they weren't carrying it. So I'm like, dude, here, <laughs> like, take this. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's those dudes, there's just so, such a wealth of knowledge there, man. And it's, it's insane. And, um, I was really humbled that they even let me come out there and I got to learn from them and that they, um, hopefully they listen to any of the, uh, you know, stuff I talked about survival preparedness wise. But, um, so yeah, man, it was, it was a great experience. So those guys, so let's kind of get into the hunt then a little bit. So you guys pack in really, really deep, right? Like 10 yeah, miles so, deep or what? So it's crazy. So we were at Cody, um, their, their shops just outside Cody. And then, so we drove about an hour and some change outside Cody um, hit the top of it. I'm going to be kind of vague mainly because I don't know exactly. Oh yeah. You don't want to, was. that you don't want to uh, give away their spot. So yeah, I don't want to give away their spot, but, uh, so we, we hit the top of this dirt road where there's some, you know, he's like, Oh yeah, they used to, you know, do all the oil and fracking and stuff out here. And, 
I was like, oh, this is cool. And he's like, yeah, it's just up the road here. I was like, oh, this is this is a cool spot. Dude, we were on that road for like an hour and a half on a dirt road. <laughs> we get back there, and they had a uh, trailer set up, like a, a camper RV style trailer. And then they, there was another big open area. So we set up a big teepee out in this open area. And uh, he's like, yeah, so we'll bed down here, and we'll set up camp, and then we'll hit it hard in the morning. Well, Again, we get in the truck from the campsite, drove an almost another hour to the base of the mountains, um, hop out of the truck, get into their Polaris that they had parked, drive another hour up into the mountains past the wilderness line to get out where we're going to get out and then pack in, you know, for a few miles. Um, so we were we were freaking out there. But um, the actual pack in was probably I don't want to sound too dramatic, but probably four to five miles, you know, Um Maybe a little less just because I was carrying weight. It felt like more, but I had it light. I was just carrying my camera gear and uh, a little bit of survival preparedness stuff. But um, they were carrying, you know, the rifles and all their own equipment. So, so were you guys? Uh, we were out. There. Were you guys staying overnight? Were you packed out, or you just like going back and forth every morning? Yeah, we typically did out and backs. Um, even we would do kind of a morning session and an afternoon session. So we'd usually wake up, you know, four thirty, four four thirty in the morning. Um, eat like a quick breakfast and then roll out before the sun came up and we usually be pulling in to kind of where we wanted to hike in um, just as the sun starting to come up over the horizon we'd hike in and uh, right as the sun was coming over um, we'd usually be in our spot or close to it and then if there wasn't anything um, or we didn't get a good shot or what didn't have a good shot or whatever uh, we'd just pack back out go back to camp and then either glass that afternoon um, just off of some other hilltops kind of because the area was really cool it was a really unique area where we could there were some smaller like foothill mountain i don't even want to call them foothills because i mean they're probably at nine ten thousand feet but um some lower mountains and then you could kind of glass a few miles away um the hillsides and the south facing slopes out uh in front of you which was typically where we drive the players back to and then be able to hunt those areas and they knew the area really well which made a huge difference um, so when you say that you were saying you were glassing the south facing slopes versus the north facing slopes yeah so um if you if you think about like and and i it wasn't specifically just the south facing slope right but if you look at it the north facing slope and it gets less sun um compared to the south and typically that's where the snow would kind of be melted off and so they'll come out of that cold um, snowier area to the more open areas to, to feed and the elk just and then as the sun and the reason we would leave those areas um, kind of like late morning and go back is typically they don't like to be you know out in the open as it gets hotter and the snow starts to melt and the trees want to drip on them so they'll, they'll go back into the colder areas where they're not going to be getting dripped on they'll bed down for the afternoon so that's pretty good. That's good intel to have then because you always hear talk about, you know, the North Face, the North Face. Not that they're only going to be on the North Face, but that's where they like mm-hmm. to bed down and, you know, kind of stay in their cover is in the dark and all that. So that's good in- mm-hmm. info, definitely. So when you guys set up and you, you would uh, do your vantage point and stuff like that, how would you uh, set up for glassing and, and, like, why would you pick that spot versus – did you kind of learn all that stuff from them or – I, I did um, not I mean I don't want to say like I know everything because I definitely <laughs> do not but I learned this it was like drinking from a fire hose you know there's just everything they said there's so much weight and value to it and um, I just tried to re- I literally just kept my camera rolling so I could at least get it all on camera and there as much of it as I could and um, retained as much as I could but yeah we would um, the areas that we would set up to glass um, in the mornings or in the afternoons depended on kind of what had happened and it, a lot of it depended on you know the last time we had spotted a herd uh, or a couple of really good bulls that we were looking at um, we'd kind of notice the direction that they were grazing and kind of make it a game plan off of that so if they're up in an area where we couldn't really get to them uh, we'd maybe the next morning just hit up you know go up glass and kind of see where they're starting to move towards watch them for a little while and make a game plan to pl- have a play on them that afternoon and then vice versa so where we were set up, we were actually able to, like I said, view out pretty far, and there was a ton of open space that they would feed and graze on. And it was crazy, actually, how noticeable they were in this specific area. 
just because of the you know the openness and the colors and that time of the year with all the snow on the ground and you know the their coat being so bright on that snow um but it, they actually we talked about um, how we break down the terrain glassing with binos versus a spotting scope and um because one thing that a lot of people don't realize that happens is you can burn your eyes out like not physically like melt them out of your skull but you'll burn out um, your ability for your, you know, how your eyes will focus. Um, like if you put your thumb out in front of you and focus on your thumb and then look five or 10 feet beyond it, your field of vision changes and your focal point changes. And by doing that over and over and over, looking through your binos and straining your eyes, trying to see what's happening, um, you can tire, tire out your eyes and then it's going to affect you later on, especially if you're behind glass on your rifle to try to take a good shot yep. on an animal. So we talked about, using binos versus spotting scope. And, um, if I'm going to use binos, I'm going to scan an area to kind of find what I'm looking for and scanning the stuff, um, that's kind of closer. Um, that's more, uh, open scanning that first being really thorough and then, um, kind of following the terrain, if you will, with your eyes and the way that you're glassing is really important. Um, it just helps you be more thorough and cover as much of the area as you can, because you think looking at it, with your naked eye, you can see like, oh, this will be easy for me to cover the whole thing. But then you look at it through a couple of tubes and, you know, that kind of gets distorted and, and you have to be very thorough. You can overlook something. And then once you've found a herd or maybe a, even a specific bull within a herd that you want to really look at, maybe if you want to see, hey, is this the quality of bull um, that I'm looking for, I, then I'll move to a spotting scope and actually um, kind of break down the animal a little bit. No, that's definitely good. I think I think a good comparison to, especially if somebody hasn't spent that much time staring through glass, it would be like if you've ever been a kid playing video games and you played them for like <laughs> yes. six hours straight and you get up and go into the kitchen to get a snack or something and you can't even yeah. hardly see anything 10 feet in front of you. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a really good, accurate representation because, I mean, you sit up there in glass for, and I didn't even conceptualize how much you would glass because just growing up on the East Coast and, and hunting for whitetail, you just don't hunt that same way. And um, But you're up there for hours at a time, you know, searching and looking and constantly on your on your bios, your spotting scopes. So it's definitely a real thing. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. I, I never realized, you know, how much glassing actually entailed or was entailed within the hunt. And same thing, you know, coming from the Midwest, you know, it, it's like all my shots are – mostly within like 40 or 50 yards at the max, you know, and, yep. <laughs> and, and sometimes you're in timber that you can't even see more than 20. Yeah, so exactly. it's, I mean, it's cool, but I definitely adapted some things I'd say from the West and brought them back, like even to the Midwest. Um, and I know a lot of other guys do it too. So it's not like I, I came up with it or anything, but I was just like, man, this really works as far as always having your binos in a harness on your chest. Um, you see some movement or what you think is a flick of an ear and it's like a hundred and something yards away. You can really, you know, get that glass out and, and get a positive idea on it and try and, you know, maybe get down, make a play, whatever. I think it's, it's definitely become helpful as far as that goes. Yeah, that's cool. So let's yeah, talk about, guy, oh, like yeah. the, go ahead, man. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry that's a little bit of a lag. No, um, what I was going to say is something else that I thought was kind of funny is um, with it being as cold as it was, uh, I mean, single digits, you know, and even down into the negatives and early in the morning. But um, you want to try to sit in the truck. You try to drive as far out as you can, and then you want to sit in the Polaris where uh, maybe you're at least close to the engine. You get a little bit of warmth. But <laughs> uh, guys will sit in their truck, and they try to glass, you know, and, the, and they're looking through a $2,000 pair of binos through a $250 windshield. And it's like, I, I don't know why I can't get the clarity I want out of these binos, you know. Like you got to get outside and I, dude, if he hadn't said that, I would have never thought of it like that. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I, I was like, but it's so warm in here, you know, like I don't have to freeze, but you got to get out there and just suck it up if you want to get that good glassing in. Well, there's a lot of guys I know that make a little fire and stuff, depending on where they're at or, you know, if it'll, they'll, they'll go up, mm -hmm. warm up by the fire, 15 minutes glass and go back, warm up. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that you learn, I guess, as you go and all that kind of stuff. But so, Absolutely. um, what, what was your like shelter setup and all that kind of stuff like then? So the, so what we actually stayed in is, um, we had a, I don't remember the name brand. Was, I meant to look it up. Was before, it like a teepee? Uh, 
or a, it was a TP. It was a TP. It was about probably a 15 foot diameter, 12 to 15 foot in diameter. And, um, we got three cots in there and we could, and it had a, an opening at the top and we could, we had a, about a two or three log, um, fireplace that we could keep in there. Um, and it was, was just it, a tiny little stove. Was it like a titanium stove? A super lightweight. Was, yeah. You had to like unpack it, unroll it and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so what, the whole, the whole TP was in like a, probably a three by two, maybe a little bigger, just box. Uh, we rolled that out, opened it, set everything up, opened it all the way up. And then, uh, and then as we kind of opened it all the way up and we got everything, um, uh, ready to go, we put out all the, our cots. And then, um, it, it was actually a really cool setup. And I, and the only thing that sucked is somebody had to be on firewatch pretty much all night. We would rotate <laughs> because the logs would just burn out in like 20 minutes and then you'd freaking freeze if you didn't. So, um, no, it, it, was, awesome. it was a really good setup. I think that's, uh, so it didn't have a floor in it, right? It was like just a shelter type. No. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I'm guessing it was either like a Kafaru or a seek outside. I'm going to, I'm going to go out. Yeah. On I, yeah. I cannot remember. He, he told me and, uh, he was super proud of it, but I, I cannot remember what it was, man, but it was no, a badass setup. No, that's cool. That's cool. It's probably super lightweight too, right? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's totally, it, yeah, it's something that you could definitely pack in. Uh, I wouldn't suggest maybe on your back, but I mean, especially if you're packing out on like horses or, or something like that, or you're not walking real far, you could, you could totally do it. Well, you don't, yeah, you don't have to have a, a 15 foot one i mean they they make actually like so what's cool is like seek outside makes one that's uh like i think it's called like the silex or something and you can get like a one man or a two man but it's totally enough mm. for you and your gear and then i've heard i don't know if it's actually true or not but you can talk to the owner and request that he put a stove jack so it eliminates one of your doors on the tent mm. but you can get a stove jack in one of those little tiny little ones and they even make them out of like dyneema or um wow so it's even lighter yet you know the cuban material yeah. or whatever it's called so like you really cut it so then it's like down to with your poles it's down to like less than sub three pounds it's like you know Whoa. It, it'd be like i think i think the shelter itself is like 14 ounces or something like that and then i think your poles are what turns it into you know i think uh, one carbon fiber pole i'm not sure what goes in the middle and then you stake it out but i mean so total weight you're you're like sub three pounds for sure you're I, wow. i'd say it's closer to two it's pretty neat i've been i've been eyeballing them pretty hard that's why i kind of know so yeah. much about them yeah but it's just like <laughs> I mean, that's a game changer, anything like, you know, and, and I've got buddies that served and stuff. And the thing they always tell me is like, you know, ounces equal pounds, pounds are pain, man. How much are you going to put on your back before? And I mean, you got some guys which are like, oh yeah, it's no big deal. I just put in what I have to and I go and hike it. But yeah, mm -hmm. you, you say that, but it doesn't mean you don't have like some of the coolest and yeah. best gear out there. Right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly, man. And, that, and that's, and I even think about it and you take it a, a step further and thinking about um, what if I do twist an ankle? What if something dumb does happen? You know, like I don't want to have to sacrifice gear, dumping it out in the back country, just in the hopes of making a, a stretch back to a vehicle or somewhere safe, you know? And, uh, but that's so true, man, because you feel tough when you start out on a hunt, when you're packing it in <laughs> and, and by the end of it, you're like, Oh, I'm kind of regretting all this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean the fact that you're calorie deficient every day, you're, you know, it, it's, <laughs> It's yeah. crazy. I mean, it's awesome. It's crazy. It's definitely one of those type two t that everybody talks about type two type of fun, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. something keeps calling me back. Like I just, I mean, I'm putting in for like oh, three different tags this year. And if I don't get it, I'm still, I have to draw an over the, get an over the counter tag and just yeah, go. Cause absolutely. I'm doing it. So yeah, yeah man, I right got to get out yeah. there, <laughs> but so let's, yeah. um, let's kind of roll into a little bit about like, um, the hunt. How, how did it end up going? So, dude, Johnny was a trooper. So Johnny had just turned 60. Um, and, dude, I he was out walking me in the <laughs> in the backcountry back there. I'm not kidding, man. I'm not just saying that. Like, the dude's a stud. And uh, he's from he was from Tennessee. And just a hillbilly. Great dude, man. Awesome guy. But, um, dude, like, I mean, he had been out there two days prior to us. And four days we went out and came back and out and came back. And a couple of times we – uh, we made a play on a couple of different bulls and, um, one time we, 
oh, man, we walked in a couple of miles and um, as we kind of circled back around, coming back towards the road, tracking down, we were f- literally following the tracks from a bull that we had seen. Um, coming back closer to the road, another public hunter rolled up and spooked them and they just ran right off. So, I mean, that happened a couple of different times. And even our, I think it was our second day out there, uh, we made a play on a couple of bulls, get down, sneak down the hill, um, get all the way set up underneath this tree. And I mean, he's on glass. Uh, I mean, he's pulling the slack out of the trigger and we get this gust of wind that comes from behind us. It goes down about 300 yards out in front of us where these bulls were circled back and hit the bulls. And you just see them put their nose in the air, just turn around and take off running. So especially as a shooter, man, that plays on your mind, you know, like, Oh dang it. Like, did I do something wrong? I should have done this. And, uh, but dude, I mean, it, it just having to happen a couple of, you know, two, three different times, four different times for him. Uh, it's the mental game too. So, but dude, he was a trooper. And, um, so we did that day in, day out. And then finally, um, our last day out, or we had one more day left before we were done. And, uh, we actually went back to the same spot we had gone on that second day, go all the way back down the hill and the bulls were right in that same spot. We were literally set up almost in the exact, um, shoot. Like you could still see the marks in the snow from his shooting <laughs> sticks the time before. And, uh, <laughs> he sets back up right there, took a shot. It was 398 yards, right at 400 yards. And he shot it, and this bull just, like, stood still. Like, you didn't see any impact on the bull. You didn't – he didn't react. And we were and, – and Ike was with him. He's like, dude, you missed. Like, reload, reload. And his little magazine, his rifle malfunctioned. So he's like, oh, no. he's like, oh damn it. Like, I can't get this out. Well, and then this bull just kind of staggers. And, I mean, it just dropped, dude. Like, all four legs out, you know, just fell over. So Johnny goes nuts. He's freaking out. He's like, dude, I just killed it. Well, then this thing stands back up and he's like, oh shit. So he's like trying to get back on his gun to get another shot of this thing. And it, it took a couple of steps and just tumbled down this hill, dude. And I mean, it tumbled like 800 yards. I mean, straight freaking down into this little <laughs> ravine next to a river, like literally the worst possible place it could have gone. That's um, typically how it goes with just about any <laughs> animal I do. So yeah. lately, lately I've been getting kind of lucky, but I've had some like that before where it's like, why did you go to the water? Why do I got to drag yeah. you out of two foot of muck just to get you back? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, what, what was he on? Like what kind of rifle was he using? And what, how far was it? I mean, was it a decent like distance or was it yeah. just, I mean, was it pretty good? Yeah. So he, he shot it at, it was right at 400 yards and it's, and he was, he's from, uh, He's from Tennessee, so he does a lot of whitetail, and he's done some mule deer out west. But he said prior to that, he'd never shot anything beyond like 100, 150 yards. So he was super nervous, um, super shook about actually having to take that shot. And uh, uh, if I recall, I think he shot with a 30 out six. I'm pretty sure it was a 30 out six. Uh, because I, we had had the discussion about, you know, six, five versus 30 odd. And, uh, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's what he'd shot with. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, he thumped that bull and they, they had some, uh, some, some badass ammo from Hornady and I can't remember what round it was, man. Dude, I, I took notes on all this and then left it at home just so <laughs> no, I remember okay. to tell you, but, um, but dude, it was, I mean, that he thumped it, dude, one round and I mean, it stood up, but just dropped, you know? Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I always kind of like wondered because you i mean you always think like should i take a 270 should i take a 300 i mean mm-hmm. i bought a 300 just so i could take it elk hunting but do you really need it probably not i mean i yeah. can't think of the guy's name but he's killed more north american big game and, and game all over the continent even elephants with the 270 so it's like yeah. shot placement is more important i think than than yep. actual you know the shot of what caliber it is but yeah, um, I, it's still, you know, I bought it. I was like, man, I, I want to make sure it's down, whatever. I'd rather, but you know how that yeah. goes. That's oh, yeah. kind of like oh, buying yeah. a truck and slapping wheels on it. Or you know. <laughs> <laughs> It is, man. And when I think about predators too, man, cause like we had a, there's a bunch of grizzly out there. I think the statistics for this past year were, uh, at least in that area of Wyoming were one in four of the kills were being taken by grizzlies. So if you think about that statistically, how many hunters there are to how many kills there were 
for that to be that many bear, I mean, that's a lot. And, um, it's a little, it's a little bit, I mean, it was definitely in the back of my mind. I mean, there's a, a spot on a tree that we passed a couple of different times with some fresh claw marks from a grizzly man. And I mean, they're, you know, I'm, I stand about six feet tall and they were just a little bit over my head. So, um, you know, that's a bear resting, you know, it's probably an eight or nine foot tall bear, you know, that's a, that's a big bear. And, um, but you think about that stopping power for a predator, man, I, I like my odds, you know? <laughs> so were you, were you packing a pistol then for personal or what? So, uh, I carried a 357 Magnum with me. Um, and one of the other guys has had one and, uh, dude, super, super thankful to have it. I mean, I, we didn't have any run-ins, but it's just that, that feeling of being completely out there. It's added and assurance, man, for sure. Oh, it is. <laughs> I mean, I mean, realistically, maybe a bear gets through it, but dude, I'm going to, I'm going to go down slinging some lead, you know, <laughs> were you at least, were you carrying like hard cast bullets and everything too? Like, oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, I think sure. that's a, uh, a thing that a lot of people probably don't think about when they're like, Oh yeah, I've got a three fifty seven or forty four Magnum or whatever. And they're carrying, you know, XTP hollow points or something. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's yeah, like something that's gonna hit the skull and no, you shatter. want deep penetration, buddy. You don't yeah. <laughs> you don't want it to fragment before it gets through the fur. Yep. But <laughs> yep. that's something that, you know, you just always gotta kinda try and educate when you can for sure about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um but that's like I always want a ten millimeter for it for taking out there just so mm-hmm. I got 20 fast rounds or whatever, you know, yeah, 16 right. fast ones, but, um, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe that'll come to at least give me an excuse to buy one anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so you guys didn't have any run-ins or anything like that, but I mean, it's kind of almost proof that it, the grizzly probably should be delisted from the, the endangered species act for sure. When you've got that many oh, encounters dude. and, and I mean, as long as it's done, you know, sustainably, it's one of those things where it can, it, you know, it, it'll actually help the population because they'll be healthier. They Absolutely. won't be trying to fight. That's um, And that's something that so many people just don't understand, man. As, and, and I'm learning it too. Like, I don't claim to, to know it all, but, uh, you know, the whole conservation um, side of the house, man, people just, so many people view hunting as this like sport and, and sure, maybe that's part of it, but. Um, the conservation side is massive, man. It's huge. And even for predators, you know, like, like you're saying about grizzly, man, it's just, people just don't educate themselves before they speak out ignorantly about these topics. No, they see um, a a Disney movie and, and want to, yeah, want to relate actual wildlife. I just, in fact, I just watched a video somebody posted, um, and it was two mule deer fighting and they actually fought to the death. One of them did not get back wow. up. He was breathing hard. He, he must have had a punctured lung or something, and he he did not get back up. And and I started thinking about it, and I'm like, that's real nature, not the nature that 100%. people want to relate. And it sometimes it's hard to convey that unless you actually show them something like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. It's and the more predators you have, you you start affecting the actual like. Uh, you can even affect like migratory patterns of these animals and, and really start affecting the population. More predators equals, you know, less calves are going to survive and you're going to have all these weird problems with herds and people just don't even conceptualize it, you know? No. Nope. Um, so let's kind of get into the pack out then. So that was your first elk that you saw being broke down. I mean, that's kind of, yeah. it almost seems like a daunting, like in my head, cause I've still actually never even broke one down either, but it's like, uh, mm-hmm. seems like a very daunting task versus a whitetail, which you can quarter up in oh, you yeah. know, a half hour or something. Oh yeah. And I, luckily we had a lot of people, you know, there were six of us, I think six of us and, uh, having that many people, um, yeah, I mean, it made a huge difference and especially having that level of experience out there made all the difference, but uh, it's definitely was a little of a intimidating process for me personally, because like you, uh, I've never really done anything that large, uh, or even close to that size. So, um, process is pretty much the same, right. But you just got to think about, you know, if you're going to cape the animal and uncorking the head and things like that, and just doing it on just a bigger scale, because there's so much more meat that can just be, you know, butchered and overlooked if you don't do it properly. Um, but I mean, the dudes were pros and, um, he had it quartered up. Pro- I want to say we were probably down there an hour, maybe hour and fifteen minutes tops. That's not too and that bad. was with, yeah, and that was with us filming. That was with him kind of teaching me, and 
um, the whole process, right? So um, probably would have had it done even faster if, if we weren't doing all that. But it's pretty impressive how much meat comes off of an animal like that. You know, we had close to 400 pounds by the time we were done. And this was, a, I think there's a 360 or 370 bull. So a good size Boone and Crockett scoring animal, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, that's a lot of weight to carry out. But like I said, we had six guys, so it spread it out pretty evenly. Were you surprised by the knives they were using? I'm guessing they were using something kind of smaller as far as, I mean, was it, was. it something, was it I, like a Tito or a, um Something. They actually have their they actually have their own blade that they made the Eastman's crew and it's it's a small interchangeable blade, um, with the uh, with the handle and it, I mean it's a cool little system but I was I was like you said I was really surprised at the size of it, I mean I grew up when my buddies would would skin animals and I would help quarter up an animal <laughs> I mean you're doing it with like an old you know somebody's old timer knife out of their pocket and it, it is what it is but I mean when you have a good blade and it, it makes a huge difference in all aspects of of survival or you, any practical application for a knife, even in a kitchen, right? Having a good blade is huge. And just, but just the size of it was, it was no more than I think <laughs> yeah. probably three inches. And I'm yeah. Like, That's like the one I use now. I think is, I think it's uh mine's three and a half. It's uh, outdoor edge. It's the EDC outdoor edge. I oh, mean, some cool. guys, yeah. I guess, use it for a pocket knife, but I use it as a hunting knife and it's interchangeable mm-hmm. blades. And then I've got a smaller yep. one even for like out West. But I mean, when I first started like deer hunting and actually field dressing deer, I used to carry a K bar. <laughs> like I would, <laughs> I would take the K bar and I take the tip and hold it in my hand and s- slit up and cut the fur, you know, yeah. and, and, and then, um, you could get in there with that and then you actually slice the diaphragm and all that and separate it. But it was cool because I could take the K bar. I could, take it and hit with my hand, which you probably shouldn't do. Right. Oh, we yeah. all learned ergonomics <laughs> now that you're not supposed to beat on things with your hands and whatnot, but yeah. I could push that blade through the rib cage, split the rib cage open wow. and then actually take it and hack on both sides of the pelvic bone and be able yeah, to pull the intestines out. Like it worked. Like was no that, kidding. is that the best choice? Is that the best way to be using that knife? It, you know, there's a lot of things that come into play there, but I thought it was cool and pretty badass. you know, yeah, but realistically, I mean, if you're going pretty deep or something like it's, I mean, that's a heavy ass knife to be taken with you. So yeah. needless to say, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. But that was uh, kind of how I used to do it, just because I, I mostly for the cool factor, I would say. But as I've gotten older, <laughs> I've learned cool factor isn't as good as practicality. So now I just carry a little tiny saw that's super lightweight and and a little Havilon yeah. or a outdoor edge. But yeah, yeah, and it, it it made a huge difference with it being as cold as it was too, because when he shot it and it fell, they went down, gutted it, um, pulled the back straps and the heart, and then came back to camp. And then the next morning we all went in and, and got the rest of it out. But it, I mean, you know, like I said, dropping down into ne- near, near zero below or just above and you go down in there and the meat was starting to freeze a little bit. And, um, you know, so that added a little bit of more time to the whole process and also, you know, the difficulty of trying to cut the hide and get into the meat when it's that cold and then thinking about, you know, cutting into the meat when your hands are frozen like that too. I mean, it's, it's a process that a lot of people don't, I, w- I wasn't, I'll just say it, I'll just say it. I wasn't prepared for the process. Of, so of when, when you yeah. guys did that, did you, uh, did you debone the meat or did you carry it out on the bone? No, we carried it out on the bone, uh, but we did um, cut the, the legs from the, the bottom joint down off um, because, I mean, there's really not a lot of purpose for them. Um, there's not a lot you can do with them. Um, but they, they actually have a really cool tradition that they, they took from a, a Native American friend, um, uh, out there and what it is is when you when you cut those lower part of their legs off um, you find a v in a tree and you put all four of those legs into the v of that tree um, and you know the thought was and the um, the tradition is that that will grow an- another elk in the place of the one that you took um, for the harvest for the next year so kind of a cool native american tradition out there and um, so i thought that was really cool but so we did cut neat. them off and yeah. yeah, that's something I never heard of before, but maybe I'll have to try and carry it on if I yeah, am successful yeah, this sure, year, man. for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you guys did the pack out. Um, what was that experience like? I'm sure you guys probably each had close to 100 pounds meat on your back or something like that, right? Yeah, dude. Yeah, so I took I, – I wanted the full experience. I told them I wanted a, a hindquarter, and <laughs> uh, they gave it to me. So um, 
So yeah, myself and another guy carried uh, the hind quarters. I think actually I think it was Scott carried the other hind quarter, and then the two front quarters. But they guessed the hind quarters were around ninety five pounds. Um, we, we never weighed them, so I don't know for sure. But uh, from my experience carrying a pack on my back, I'd say they were probably being a little conservative with that guess. Um, <laughs> you always think that <laughs> until you actually put it on the scale, though. I will say that. <laughs> That's true. That's I mean, true. I, I had a buddy, um, Marine, like super hoorah, like all the time, just, yeah. you know, and, and he's gotten older and, and fatter and all these different things. And, and I'm like, dude, man, if you're going out west, you better start preparing for it. You better start rucking. You better, you better get, no, I'm fine. I can get it. It's all mental. I can get through this. And I'm like, listen, you take blood pressure medication and all other kinds of things. Listen to me, please. So he's like, okay, fine. So we go and he puts a bag of rock salt and we go hiking uh, pretty extensive trails, whatever we got. And um, he goes, man, oh, and he's huffing and puffing and sucking wind. And we, yeah. went, oh, yeah. we, went, we went like two miles, right? And I, I put 60 pounds of sand in my pack just because I was like, I had to show him up and prove him heavy. <laughs> and um, he, he puts weight in his and it's a bag of rock salt. And he goes, oh, it's got to be like 60 pounds in here. <laughs> We get out and I pull the bag out and it says 35 pounds. And I'm like, I go 60 pounds. It's 35, bro. And he goes, Oh, that's a wake up call. Isn't it? So then yeah. like, you know, he actually got it and he started, he started like actually carrying and he'd do that. And he was, he actually started hitting it pretty hard after that. And he was carrying his son as, which was like, I think a year and a half or something at the time. And oh, so yeah. he was carrying the kid and the pack with extra weight in it yeah. and, and there going go. deep and far for a while before he went on his hunt. And he's like, man, that, that, that definitely helped. I'm glad you, yeah. <laughs> you got me doing that, but it's just funny how yeah. sometimes you, you think that, but realistically, that's true, man. It's, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from, from your story at all, but I'm just trying to bring a little bit of reality into it is that no, people you're right, often, man. you're right often overestimate the load but um and they even did i saw something they did an article and and they had like two or three elk they packed out and everybody guessed the load and then when they got back they actually weighed the pack to see if they were accurate or not with the guest guesstimate and they were i think they were like it was like a 60 percent accuracy or something so i mean i'm not saying you're not but yeah it was like a 60 percent accuracy of of actual weight so um but yeah i wouldn't doubt it it, it was, was probably humbling. close and it felt like a hundred pounds, right? <laughs> oh, it, it felt like 200 pounds. Yeah. You know, but, <laughs> and I, that first initial walkout, man, like I said, it fell down in this ravine. So part of it, I mean, was a gosh, like a, just about like a 50 degree angle getting up in this initial, like couple hundred meters, 150 meters. And then after that, it was uphill for probably a half mile. And I mean, literally we had to go up that side of the mountain. We could have side hill around, but it would have added a good distance to the walk and uh so we walked that you know quarter mile up up the mountain and which was brutal which took up you know an hour just getting up to the top of that and uh, but after that we were able to side hill around and kind of pack out the last about four miles and uh it's i mean and you know this but that experience of like even though it sucks when you get through it and you get back it just adds to the whole overall experience you know so Absolutely. So we're using trekking poles. I wasn't. No, um, the smart guys did, but I wasn't <laughs> because you didn't have them or you're just too stubborn at that point. That's... I, I had them, but I was trying to do the filming thing. So I had my camera and I was like, I can either pick the trekking poles or the camera and I picked the camera and, uh, my back wasn't very happy with that decision. Yeah. Cause I have totally learned that the whole trekking pole thing is, I mean, and, and I don't remember who, I think it might've been like Randy Newberg or somebody who's like, it's like yeah. four wheel drive for your legs. <laughs> and it's totally <laughs> true. I mean, yeah. it makes a world of difference for sure. So you guys get back and you get the, you know, all the stuff back and everything. And I mean, how, how was the haul out after that? I mean, everybody oh, man, just was... took one load or was it, did you have to yeah, go back we... in? No, we didn't have to go back in. And the night before, um, we actually did the lo- the pack out when they brought those back straps and the heart back. Uh, we had set up this big bonfire outside and we were like, we're not going to light it until we get the, until we drop this bull. And we lit up the bonfire and cooked up the heart and the back strap. And, um, dude, I, I don't know what it is, but, and then the next night after the pack out, we ate, um, part of the tenderloin, man. And I, 
dude, I don't know what it is, but it just tastes that much better after you get, you know, after a pack out. Yeah. I think, I honestly think elk meat tastes better than venison, like, like a white tail or anything like that. I just, something about it, it's got like a sweeter taste to it. I mean, if you think about it, they're a grazer like cattle versus, an, you know, a browser yeah. that's going to eat other stuff like that too. So, I mean, maybe sure, that's why, yeah. I don't know. But yeah, elk meat is definitely by far, in my opinion, better oh, than, yeah. than whitetail. But. So good. And they even said, the Eastman's guys are saying, you know, if you really want the best meat, don't get an older bull. You know, the bigger older bull probably is not as good as if you were to eat like a, a younger um, female. You know, that's really where you're going to get that tender meat. So, <laughs> something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I, and plus, though, I mean, you got to imagine like the experience, the setting, everything is playing into that whole the whole experience as far as the taste mm-hmm. of that, you know, meat and everything. Oh, too. True, so, for sure. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, man. Um, what did you learn as far as like camera and filming and all that kind of stuff? Oh, man, that it was huge. And, you know, I I aspire to do all things outdoors. And I mean, that's where I live a large portion of my life just doing any and every activity I can and being able to carry a camera with me everywhere I go is super important to me just because one, I love it. And two, I love educating people and being able to share that experience with people who either can't um, get out and go do those things just due to where they live or uh, the nature of their lifestyle and, or the people that just can't get out to those locations, right? Somebody on the East coast wants to see Utah, like, or wherever I'm at, I just want to share that experience. So, but going out and I overprepared, um, as far as camera equipment went, you know, I took a ton of batteries with me. Uh, I took backup audio equipment. I took up, I took uh, backup lenses. I actually had an extra camera body that I took with me just in case. And, um, I carried it all in a, in a seahorse case. And, um, luckily it, it, it panned out and I would just take the batteries because the big thing is, is batteries will get cold soaked. And what I, what that means is just, you know, if anybody that's had anything out that's battery powered in the cold, the batteries die a lot faster. Um, so what I would do is I would take, uh, two spare batteries and I'd put them on my innermost layer, uh, or on my innermost jacket and carry them close to my body to keep my body heat, to keep the temperature a little warmer so they wouldn't die as fast. And so that, that worked really well. And I went through about a battery every day ish, a little less than, and, uh, I had ended up with. I said, if everything went perfect, I'd use this equipment and this equipment alone. And it, it worked out just like that. Um, so a lot of it was just the planning, you know, planning it out, having spares, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, it worked out really, really well, man. I didn't have any problems. No, that's, that's good. Um, did you learn anything about like the differences in, you know, shot angles or kind of totally. stuff like that? Yeah. I- a big part of uh, filmmaking is um, the story, is telling the story. And, and you know, I, I'm really new at this, but um, that's the most important thing to me, right? Like, I mean, there's there's tons of examples all over YouTube and the Internet that of people making great videos with just a cell phone, where, but they tell the story and it's something that people can relate to and something people enjoy, um, the experience that they get from the video. And that was really my biggest goal with this whole video and putting it together was I wanted people to feel like they were there. I wanted them to get some of the lessons that were there to be learned, um, and kind of get some of the overall experience of, of the, the kind of the journey behind the whole thing. And, um, the, the, you know, the great parts of killing something and, and bringing it back and harvesting the meat and, and then the, even the, the parts where it's like, you know, you get set up and you don't get the shot or you miss or whatever, you know? So, uh, but there's, there's a whole experience there that so many people that don't hunt never get, or, and they don't even know how to dip their toes in that. And so I just, I really wanted to bring that to somebody, um, for them to experience it, even if they never go on a hunt ever in their life. I think what you said there is 100% true and, and needs to be brought to light more. And I've talked about it with a couple other people, um, that do podcasts and stuff like that. But I mean, it's so true. A lot of times all people see is like a grip and grin photo and the dead animal with a hunter, but they don't see the pain in somebody's face and the sweat on their brow from their calves burning as they just walked three miles with, you know, like you said, a hundred pound load on their back or the fact that it took them five days and, you know, they lost like 
five percent body mass or something just trying to chase that animal through the mountains it, i mean so many things like that or even the fact that they're sitting there glassing and the beautiful sun rises and the fog lifting off the mountain and things like that that just they will never ever ever see yeah and i think that's amazing when people can actually bring that into a story and i think we definitely need to do more of that especially in you know as a hunting community educate people on the full experience versus just the dead animal or the stuff some idiots do on TikTok or whatever that, yeah. you know, pose them with a dead animal in some stupid way or something. Cause yeah. I mean, like, like you said, just bring it, tie it all together and, and make it to where somebody's like, wow, that maybe I want to do that. Or maybe, yeah. maybe I can talk to my neighbor about that versus hate them or, you know, anything like that. I think yeah. that's, that's, that's definitely huge. Um, so I think that's a good point to end it, man. That's awesome interview. Kind of awesome to hear your experience, especially coming from like a non elk hunter and going out and kind of, yeah. kind of doing that and taking away your points, especially with people like the Eastman's. Right. I mean, they've totally. been doing it so long and, and definitely know yeah. the game. So I appreciate it, man. Can you tell everybody where they can find you and um, find your content and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for the experience coming on. It's been awesome. Uh, it's good talking uh, about these experiences. But yeah, you can uh, you can find me on Instagram at Savage Lester, L-E-S-T-E-R, and uh, working for Fieldcraft Survival and find us uh, at Fieldcraft Survival on Instagram as well. Um, the whole video of the whole experience is on the Fieldcraft Survival YouTube channel. Um, just go on YouTube, type in Fieldcraft Survival, and the video is, is named A Hunter's Journey. Um, so go on there and give it a watch. It's about 39 minutes, I believe. And, uh, just kind of tells the story. And like I said, the whole experience. So, uh, hopefully you guys can check it out and we'll enjoy it and just give me your feedback. You know? Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on and sharing. We truly appreciate it and, uh, take care, man. Yeah. Thanks Luke. You too. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. Mm-hmm.